Hello, welcome to South Pacific's private webinar series. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Alyssa Layler and I am the program director at South Pacific Private. The topic today that I'm going to discuss is depression, recovery and staying well. Please, if anything does come up for you during this presentation, please feel free to call South Pacific Private on one 800 63 Otherwise, please enjoy this 20 to 30 minute presentation. So today I'm just going to run through a few things. So we're going to look at what is depression. We're going to look so at some of the signs and symptoms and types and causes of depression. We're going to look at addiction and depression, the South, the South Pacific private treatment recovery model, and as well ways that we can stay well during our, the recovery phase. So just firstly, as you can see, we're going to spend some time on what is what is depression? What is the difference between just normal sadness versus clinical depression? Of course, with sadness, we can all feel sad. We can feel sad when we watch a movie. We can feel sad after a relationship breakdown. However, sadness doesn't interfere with our capacity to function on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't interfere with our capacity to fill important roles and responsibilities, such as going to work or studying, looking after our family and children, going out with friends, maybe looking after our house, or completing studies or domestic duties. This is what we would call depression. Depression is quite insidious and affects all aspects of someone's capacity to function. You can see with some of the statistics that approximately 1 million Australians are living with depression in any given year. One in five Australians will be impacted by a depressive illness in their lifetime. Currently, depression is the leading cause of ill health and disability worldwide, with more than 300 million people now living with depression. So just take some time now to reflect on your family and friends and work colleagues how many of you are there? Depression is so common, yet it remains an illness that is hidden. If someone that you know has been affected by depression, or you yourself has been affected by depression, the other people around you will have to pick up the pieces. As such, it's not just the person with depression that gets impacted. It's actually everyone around them that gets impacted. So here are just some common types of depression. So major depression is really the depression that we're going to focus on here. It's manifested by a combination of symptoms, which are going to be are listed shortly that interfere with the ability to work, study, sleep, eat, and enjoy once pleasurable activities. Such a disabling episode of depression may occur only once, but more commonly occurs several times in a lifetime. Dysthymia. This is a less severe type of depression. It involves long-term chronic symptoms that do not disable, but keep one from functioning well or feeling good. Many people with dysthymia also experience major depressive episodes at some time in their lives. So if you can sort of imagine dysthymia as that you're walking around being sort of a, a 4 out of 10, but you never quite make it up to a 7 or an 8. But within that time, you can actually dip to a negative 1, a negative 2. So it's really chronic, long-lasting depression. And then finally, something very common that we see at South Pacific Private in particular is substance medication-induced depression. So depressive symptoms appear during or within one month after using the substance when the symptoms cannot be better explained by another de dis depressive disorder. There is a client history, physical exam, or lab findings that confirm substance use, abuse, intoxication, or withdrawal pr prior to the start of a depressive symptom. So here 
are the specific symptoms of what we call major depressive episode or clinical depression. So a set number of these symptoms, so five out of nine are required to present over at least a two week period in order for the diagnosis to be given. So you need to have constant feelings of sadness, irritability or tension, decrease interest or pleasure in usual activities or hobbies, loss of energy, feeling tired despite lack of activity, a change in appetite with significant weight loss or weight gain, a change in sleeping patterns such as difficulty sleeping, early morning awakening or sleeping too much, restlessness or feeling slowed down, a decreased ability to make decisions or concentrate. So some of you might even find you can't read a book anymore. You can't pay attention to your favorite television program. There's going to be feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, and guilt. Thoughts of suicide or death. You don't have to have suicidal thoughts in order to be diagnosed with depression. You need five out of these nine. So just looking at the thought, feeling, behavior connection. If we just look at this quickly, if I'm having thoughts that are very typical of depression, because depression really, really acts on your capacity to think and how you perceive the world is something that we call like a negative mental filter. So friends and family might make comments like, why are you so sad? You have a great life. And although, yes, rationally you have a great life, when you're perceiving your life, you cannot see the good things that are happening because depression acts on that, on the cognitions. So you might have thoughts such as, I'm worthless, things will never get better, or what's the point? Now, if you're having those sort of thoughts, it would make sense that the feelings connected to it might be sadness, depressed, hopeless, helpless, guilt, worthless. You could have a lot of anger towards yourself, towards the world. Why is everyone else happy and I'm not? You could be frustrated with yourself. Why can't I get better? You have an idea of what you, how you were functioning before. And right now, you wouldn't be functioning that way. And of course, there's apathy, which really comes to that point of oftentimes no return, where suicidal thoughts are very active. Because you're apathetic, you're thinking, what is the point? And if you have those thoughts, those feelings, it would make sense that behaviorally you're going to be fatigued, you're going to be very tired, you're not sleeping well, you're sleeping too much, 14, 15 hours a day, and still you're exhausted, or you can't sleep, you have ruminating thoughts all night long, usually about past events things that you could have done differently, things that should have turned out differently. You might be eating too much. You might be loading up on carbs, eating lots of sugar, or else you kind of just forget to eat. You might have a low sex drive. You're going to start to withdraw from, from your social circle. People might be asking you if you're okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. You start forgetting to return voicemails, text messages, emails, you kind of go off the radar. You're just getting by until you can no longer pretend that you're okay. You stop doing enjoyable activities, you stop going to footy training, you stop catching up for coffee with your friends, you stop meeting the mums after school, you stop going out with your friends from work. Everything starts to shut down. And then you start to neglect yourself as well. As you can see, they're all interconnected. Your thoughts and feelings and behavior in terms of depression are all interconnected. So let's look at some of the causes of depression. Unfortunately, there's no single cause. Often it's a result of a combination from a lot of things. We call this sort of psychosocial factors. You might have a family history of depression. Maybe your mom or your dad suffered with depression. You have an aunt. You have someone else within your family who has been dealing with depression. You might have a genetic 
predisposition to experience depression that does not get activated until there's a traumatic event or stressful life events, such as financial problems, the breakup of a relationship, the death of a loved one. You can become depressed after changes in your life, like having to start a new job, graduating from school, or even getting married. There's also research to suggest that a pessimistic personality could allow someone to be more vulnerable to experience an episode of depression. So this is the half empty. Or physical conditions. There's lots of research to suggest that those women that are that are suffering from breast cancer are far more likely to experience a depressive episode as a result. Heart disease. If I've been very unwell and have had to take a lot of time off of work, it would make sense that behaviorally I've started to disconnect from my network. I'm more in my head. I have more time to think. I'm already feeling sad and depressed because of my physical ailment. It leaves me more vulnerable to experience an episode of depression. And other psychological disorders, such as anxiety, eating disorders, schizophrenia, and especially substance abuse, often appear alongside depression. So let's look more specifically at addiction and depression. South Pacific Private is one of the tr one of the leading treatment centers for addiction and looking at the co-occurring psychological psychiatric disorders such as depression and anxiety. Oftentimes people don't set out to be addicted. <clears throat> Nobody chooses, oh, I'd really like to be addicted to alcohol one day, and starts out sort of self-medicating. You use alcohol to get out of your head, to forget what's going on. However, alcohol <clears throat> is actually a depressant. <clears throat> it acts on the central nervous system, and the use of this drug or a substance tends to trigger depression-like symptoms such as lethargy, sadness, or hopelessness. However, unfortunately, many depressed individuals will reach out for drugs or alcohol as a way to lift their spirits or to numb their painful thoughts. As a result, depression and substance abuse can feed into each other, and one condition will often make the other one worse. When an individual has both depression and addiction, we call it a dual diagnosis. A dual diagnosis can be made up of any combination of mental disorder, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, addiction, drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling. The dual diagnosis that include depressive disorders are among the most common forms of the problem. So clinical depression poses a real high risk of accidental injury, self-harm and suicide. Depression can suppress the immune system and weaken the body making you more susceptible to physical ailments or chronic illness. And also when you add drugs or alcohol to the mix, the risks to your physical and emotional health, health will increase exponentially. So really that's why enrolling in a specialized treatment program, such as the one that we have at South Pacific Private, can help you avoid the devastating effects of depression and substance abuse and can help you create a healthy, satisfying life you deserve. We really promote an abstinence-based treatment program at South Pacific Private. We believe in recovery, both from depression and through the addiction. So how do we do that? So just really briefly, I'm just going to quickly go through the South Pacific Private Recovery Treatment Model, in how we would conceptualize depression. So this is called the Model of Developmental Immaturity. And this model is really a reflective tool that's adaptable to other evidence-based psychological theories. It provides both the, the clinician and the clients with a common language to assist communication. This model describes how a childhood environment 
that is generally less nurturing can lead to immaturity issues in adulthood. So if we look just on the left hand side, the nature of a child, there are five characteristics that all children have simply because they're born. Children are valuable, vulnerable, imperfect, dependent and spontaneous and open. Functional parents, parents that provide emotional nurturing, as well as meeting the basic needs of food, shelter, can help their children develop each characteristic so they arrive at adulthood as mature people who feel good about themselves. But often what can happen is that when one of these five natural characteristics that all children are exposed to, dysfunctional parenting or less than nurturing parenting, so if something has happened, whether it's a traumatic event or stress within the family system, it can lead someone more susceptible to experiencing in issues such as depression. So it could be child abuse, or it could just be shaming, neglected, or just not nurtured. The consequence of this, you can see the core issues, but the consequence of this, if we look at the primary symptoms, is that children learn to adapt to their environment in order to protect themselves from being overwhelmed. The child then adapts out of being their own authentic self, and they can lose touch with their own sense of value and their sense of self. And as a result of the primary symptoms, you can look at secondary symptoms and relational problems. So these are the presenting problems that usually occur that lead someone into treatment. So you can see depression is at top of, top of the list. So really when we're looking at conceptualizing depression, and we're looking at how to treat the depression. We're looking at how can we treat the primary symptoms. So more specifically, how do we treat the primary symptom of self-esteem? Well, a common, a common result of depression is that it, it really does have a knock-on effect on someone's sense of self. Depression affects a person's esteem. A depressed person often feels worse, worthless or less than. I am not good enough. When we look at the second core issue, boundaries, this is really about self-protection from self and others. Depression can be reflective of a damaged internal boundary. How you are talking to yourself, how you are allowing the impact of the stressful life events to impact you and the way you start to perceive yourself in terms of your self-esteem as well. So it affects the way a person thinks about themselves, others, and the world around them. External boundaries are also damaged as other people are affected by a person's depressed state. Reality, our self-identity, the way we think, feel, and behave, the distorted thinking that I mentioned previously, the negative mental filter, a person begins to see the world through this negative lens. Dependency, if we look at this through self-care, taking care of self by expressing feelings appropriately can help manage depression versus stuffing feelings can exacerbate depression. For example, when you know that you're not traveling well and someone asks you, are you okay? And the response is actually, I'm fine. But internally, you are actually crushed. You are not okay. However, the depression is telling you not to tell anyone or that no one's going to understand. So actually that healthy expression of feelings, especially anger, is essential in the management of depression allowing people to know that you are not okay, which goes with moderation, that self-containment, being able to ask and receive help, letting people know how you're traveling, I'm not traveling very well, I think I need some help, and then allowing someone 
to help you. So it is remaining in relationship with others despite that urge to withdraw, which is a symptom of depression. Depression is telling you to stay home, to stay in your bedroom. No one's going to understand. You have nothing to offer the world. However, in order to manage depression, it really is about staying in relationship with others, staying in connection somehow. If you want any more information on the South Pacific Private Recovery Treatment Model, please feel free to listen to the webinar series specifically about the model. So now just looking at recovery and staying well. So some of the recovery options for depression in particular is, is pharmacology. So these are your antidepressants. And these can often be the cornerstone for treatment of depression. However, it's not the be all and end all. South Pacific Private provides a more holistic approach to recovery which includes psychotherapy. So at South Pacific Private, you're going to have access to a dedicated medical team, including psychiatrists, GPs, as well having daily group therapy focused groups that are going to reflect not only on early childhood experiences that are going to help develop core beliefs, your schemas, how you think about yourself, how you perceive yourself, but also we're going to look at sort of what we call behavior activation. This idea of do what you least want to do. Depression and addiction together often result in someone withdrawing from their life, losing connection, not living their life the way they're used to living. If you have no issue with addiction and depression is really your primary cause, again, getting active in your life. It's not a way to cure depression, but it's a way to manage your depression. You can find a way to live with depression is really about accepting, first of all, that you do have an illness and that there is treatment out there. We would much rather see you at South Pacific Private or a GP or your psychiatrist or friends and family would much rather know that you're starting to slip or you're not traveling well rather than the spiral that occurs, that you end up at the bottom of a hill, the bottom of a hole, and you can't find your way out. It is much easier to climb out of a hole if you're halfway down than if you're at the bottom. And that really is despite feeling depressed, despite having depression, you still have some sort of connection with what you consider your normal life. So we're going to do that through group therapy. One of the cornerstones of treatment at South Pacific Private is also family therapy. As I mentioned previous, depression is a really insidious illness and it affects all aspects of one's capacity to function and it will impact the family. It will impact your partner, it will impact your kids, it will impact your mom, your dad, your flatmates. So we look at family therapy as a way that the families or the supporters get a unique insight on how best to help you in your recovery journey and how best to help themselves in their recovery journey. We also offer an array of day programs, Mastering Moods, which looks, which looks specifically at 
mood disorders and depression, as well as our relapse prevention that looks at the dual diagnosis between addiction and depression. And of course, we always recommend individual therapy and ongoing therapy once you complete our program at South Pacific Private. So thank you very much for joining me today in the webinar series of Depression, Recovery, and Staying Well. If anything has sparked interest for you, or as I said, if anything comes up for you, if anything's been triggering for you, if it's for your, yourself or your friends or family, please feel free to call us on 1-800-063-332. One of our dedicated intake officers will be there to take your call. So again, please reach out. You don't need to go through this alone. There's plenty of help out there. You can also email us on info at southpacificprivate.com.au. Our Twitter and our Facebook are there for you as well. Thank you once again for joining me.